Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Um, I just want to say up front, I, I probably won't be talking about the life cycle. Um, but having said that and um, taking on board some of the things that were said today, um, I, I will say tea tree has been around for a long time. Just ask Rurik. Um, but the accumulation of industry knowledge and the building of industry cohesion for a crop that is really quite outside the square takes a long time, especially if uh, what have seemed like easier choices have inserted themselves into the industry dialogue along the way. So the views that I express here today are personal. They do not reflect the views of the Industry Association, though I'm not in conflict with the Industry Association, and they don't reflect the views of another company with which I'm associated called NRIA. They're personal views. I actually do have a great deal of confidence in the future of the Australian tea tree industry, but it is, and it remains, a long journey, an expensive one, and full of commercial um, challenges. And many futures have been proposed for tea tree, and most of them have revolved about tea tree being some kind of new age wonder therapy that will treat everything from cancer to pimples, herpes to wound infections. Oh, and it's good for cleaning up the ticks and fleas on the dog on the way through. And you know what? There's a remarkable amount of truth in those claims and in the vision. But neither the vision nor the truth can be fully realised without the significant investment of both time and of money. So when I ponder the future of the tea tree industry, I am forced to question, to define, at least for my own business, what makes up the in that industry and where can it take me? All the information that is collected in the tea tree industry is collected on a voluntary basis by the industry association. And that uh, collection has indicated historically that the industry consistently produces something in the order of four to 500 tonnes of tea tree oil per annum. Maybe another 50 or 100 tonnes is grown overseas from Australian supplied seed, another great export. A further unknown quantity of synthetic oil is also manufactured overseas and sold as pure Australian tea tree oil, a battle we fight in the marketplace every day. We now know by a statistics finally being able to be collected by um, the ABS on our behalf that approximately 80 to 90 per cent of our oil is exported. Historically we've understood that 50 per cent of that goes to US Canada and the other half goes to European Union UK but we know definitively that in 2012 it would seem that the EU has dropped off considerably with the slack taken up by China, but Asia generally, um, and the rest distributed across the world to Central and South America, South Africa, etc. and 40 tonnes, no one quite knows why, went to New Zealand. Oh, and of course, at home we consume about 50 to 70 tonnes for domestic consumption. So you can see that just about all of our product goes overseas. Conversely, mint oil production and consumption is in thousands of tonnes. Over 20,000 tonnes of mint oil were produced in America alone in 2008. So why is tea tree oil only in the hundreds of tonnes? Mint oil extracts are preferred for use in chewing gums, dental flosses, mouthwashes, toothpastes. They're used for expectorants or soothing properties in cough syrups and lozenges, etc. But mm, hang on, tea tree is also used in these products. So why? Why so little tea tree oil? The answer is at once simple and very complex. Tea tree oil is not a food and it's not a commodity product though it is traded like one. It isn't about taste, it isn't about texture or smell unless you have some sort of antiseptic fetish. People buy a tea tree oil product 
because they believe that it will provide them with some kind of therapeutic benefit. Tea tree oil therefore lives in a world where therapeutic claims are being made. And that puts us into, very, into the very complex and expensive world of big pharma and multinationals. If you go to the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods hosted by the TGA, then you can look up tea tree oil and find out whether or not the product you want to use or have already used is listed. Good manufacturers in Australia have their products listed. Tea tree oil, its efficacy and its safety is well understood and recognised by the TGA based on evidence that has been supplied over decades. Every company that seeks a listing must provide basic efficacy data and basic safety data before a listing will be approved. But note, these are all over-the-counter medicines with descriptive claims that are regulated by the TGA. These same products are also sold overseas, but there the claims cannot be made at all. However, in the US, for example, as you can see from the snip that I've taken off a US website, something as personal as a vaginal suppository can be sold over the counter, clearly for a purpose, with almost a claim. But also with a clear statement that the FDA knows nothing about this product. The product isn't sold illegally, it's just sold in a completely uncontrolled way. The sad thing is that the almost claims are in fact truths for the use of tea tree oil to treat almost all of the conditions. Tea tree is one of the most studied essential oils in the world. It has been extensively reviewed, especially for efficacy, by almost every regulatory body of every country in the world. Tea tree oil is correctly identified as having antibacterial, antifungal and antiviral qualities as well as providing a degree of anti-inflammatory and analgesic effect. And yet, outside Australia, tea tree is relegated to a world of almost. Almost making a claim and very careful not to. So why? Why aren't these products sold with claims? Because to transform, transform these products into genuine therapeutic products with claims, perhaps even to turn them into medicines, is so expensive in overseas markets that it has not been worth the commercial uh, investment. And frankly, in a lot of these markets, for example in this market, they're able to get away with it, so why would they? Australia's complementary medicines legislation is, I have discovered, quite unique. Tea tree is grown in the northern New South Wales and on the Atherton Tableland. It grows best, along with guar apparently, between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. And establishment of the first tea tree plantations, as commercial plantations, started in the early 1980s in northern New South Wales. Prior to that, the industry had been based exclusively on wild harvest, and to the quality of the oil being harvested was a bit hit and miss. In fact, the trees that were being planted in the plantations were a bit hit and miss. Because it's not just any tree of Melaleuca alternifolia that can produce the therapeutic type tea tree oil. And so, to truly define our oil and to separate it from other Melaleuca oils that were being extracted, an Australian standard was first described in 1988. An international standard followed and both have been modified and tightened since then. <coughs> With the support of Rurik, a tree breeding program commenced in the 1990s and over time, careful and controlled selections of breeding stock means now that the whole Australian industry produces a terpene rich tea tree oil with high therapeutic values. Tea tree oil is defined by the Australian and the international standards, as I said, and is also described in the British and European pharmacopoeias and a few monographs and any other number of other definition type documents. But such documents only provide 
a definition of what is or what should be. And that's critical, in, especially in helping to identify bastardised or synthetic oils. But they are not documents that in and of themselves allow product developers or manufacturers overseas to achieve regulatory approval of tea tree products. So, back to the beginning. As I said, many futures have been proposed for tea tree oil. But there are two different motivations and there are two different visions in play. A tea tree farmer's vision is to produce the most oil, suitable for market, at the least cost price, and able to sell it at the highest price. I think we're all familiar with this scenario. And a tea tree farmer's vision is to have other farmers doing pretty much exactly the same thing as he or she is. But what if our produce, our tea tree oil, isn't, you know, produce? What if our product is actually, really, just another raw material chemical input for a product developer to choose from, out of thousands? Not only must our tea tree oil be extremely price competitive, it must be intrinsically desired by the manufacturer for the properties that only our tea tree oil can supply. And most of all, it must be an easy choice. The factors that influence the choice of tea tree oil as a raw material for putting into a tea tree product are consumer demand, supply stability, price stability consistency in the qualities and the chemical characteristics of the oil, the standards. Consistency in odour and colour, because manufacturers really don't deal with variability very well at all. Proven safety, proven efficacy, and comfort that the ingredient, tea tree oil, has regulatory approval, or at the very least that it is not banned or restricted. And it's the last three the safety, the efficacy, and the regulatory compliance, which are the make or break for us being able to sell our tea tree oil and have it chosen as a raw material ingredient. Because otherwise the manufacturer simply creates a new product line with a different raw material and he tells the consumer a new story, possibly a more exciting story. If it all gets too hard, it's simply dropped. And the reason is not just that we're hard, but that in reality, historically, our largest market, the largest uptake of tea tree oil in the world is in cosmetics. And that's important. My vision is to build an agricultural industry. My buyer's vision is to build a manufacturing base and increase his share of the cosmetic products market. My buyer can build his business out of virtually anything he doesn't need my tea tree oil, but I sure as heck need him. So our best selling consumer product here or overseas is actually tea tree oil in a bottle. In December 2004, the Consumer Products Regulator in Europe was asked to decide whether or not tea tree was a safe cosmetic ingredient. Ambiguously at the time, tea tree in oil in a bottle was classified in some European countries as a cosmetic. The SCCP published an opinion stating that they didn't have enough evidence to determine whether the answer to the question of safety could be established. And they required the tea tree industry to respond within 12 months by submitting a full regulatory toxicity safety dossier. The Tea Tree Industry Association was able to put together a group of industry participants to invest in a project that was co-funded by RODIC to respond to the SCCP request. That was the first time, in fact, that ADIA had been able to actively engage the cooperation and financial input from overseas companies. We got two of them, one from the USA, who exported to Europe, and one European company. The Europeans, in fact, were very divided about whether or not we should even respond to the request because it, it's a natural product. It's safe. But over and above that, there was an air from the Europeans of, well, if you want us to buy it, you should be providing the data. The safety regulations overseas are overwhelmingly designed for single component synthetic ingredients 
not for multi-component, variable, natural ingredients. And until very recently, in the last few years only, Europe has had no equivalent at all to our Australian complementary medicines legislation, and the USA does not at all. But nevertheless, a dossier was created and submitted, and so today, at least, tea tree remains available in the EU as a cosmetic ingredient. But tea tree oil in a bottle can never again be described as a cosmetic, nor should it. And in fact, unless it is separately approved now in the European Union as a herbal medicine, it must be withdrawn from sale. In Europe, we have partially answered the concerns of the consumer goods regulator. However, the non-trade barrier, that is the REACH legislation, is moving ever closer to a day of reckoning for tea tree. This is all doom and gloom, but it does get better. Anything, anything that is not approved for use in Europe and the UK under one of the European di directives, biocides, medicines, ag vet, plant protection, cosmetics, must comply with REACH. It's a catch-all. The level of compliance is determined by the volume of the material being sold in Europe and by the absolute hazard that the material poses, even if the risk is very, very small. So, for example, BHP, which imports iron ore into the European Union for steel manufacture in Finland, has been required to provide a full toxicological safety data package on iron ore. No matter which way it turns, tea tree is confronted with the need to meet overseas regulatory guidelines by providing toxicological studies, which are unfortunately are only generated at great cost. And so even though 2018 is the last day by which we have to comply with REACH in Europe, we are being asked today by our customers whether or not we comply. For example, US customers who manufacture products of tea tree and export them to Europe want REACH compliance. So the pressure is on. It comes to this, if tea tree as an industry is to grow and not to meander, we have to submit our product to regulatory scrutiny of the tightest kind and to the highest international levels. This is a multi-million dollar exercise and it involves things like clinical trials. It is a task largely beyond the capabilities and certainly the pockets of our farmers and it's a job for product formulators and manufacturers and not those situated in Australia who have no need or incentive to do it. It is an investment that has to justify the risk through the creation of IP that rewards the person or the entity making that investment. The basic proof of concept work for our industry has been done and done well by the Adia Rodek Research Program and should continue to be done. But it does also now need product development and commitment to securing overseas approvals. Yep. Fortunately, the industry does have several Australian participants making this investment, and only time will tell whether the risk is worth the reward and whether an industry will continue to grow because the only way to grow is to prove the claims and the safety of our products in ways that are recognised by overseas regulators and product developers and manufacturers. R&D and creation of regulatory packages is in fact going forward in areas as diverse as the control of skin cancers, the control of golden staff, treatment of sheep lice, stock feed additives and the clinical control of acne. It really only needs one of these products to succeed in one regulatory market and the doors will open. And in fact, I know that several of these products are very close to achieving that status. And why I'm upbeat is because then demand, not supply, will be our problem. And how good will that be? So as a glass half full kind of girl, I actually think that the future of our industry is about to arrive and the journey can, in fact, continue.